God's word often addresses our imagination, invites us to imagine and to see, if you will, along with the writers of scripture. This morning we have this wonderful vision from John's revelation. But imagination and imagining things according to God's word is not quite the same thing as make-believe. I'm going to invite you this morning on a little make-believe adventure with me, okay? So put away your imagination, a faithful and good imagination trained by God's word, and do a little make-believe exercise with me. I want you to make-believe that Jesus were sitting down with campaign advisors. Apparently there's an election. I didn't know. But it seems like the right time of year to talk about these things. So come with me on to make-believe land. We'll see why it's make-believe and not good, faithful imagination in just a minute. Picture Jesus sitting in a big boardroom, sitting down at a table with a bunch of consultants. There on the table, they have their graphs, they have their charts, they have their data, they have their focus group research. It's all out in front of them, and yet still they look very concerned, don't they? Lots of furrowed brows, stress writ large on their faces. So, they say, Jesus of Nazareth, you're thinking of running for office. Well, your appearance is rather ordinary, but that's okay. We can alter that. There's always makeovers. Tell us about your message, though, Jesus. That's what we're here to talk about. Tell us your platform. Now, imagine Jesus sitting there and saying, like he did in our gospel reading this morning, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Okay, say the consultants. We see what you're doing. You're going for the down and out vote, right? The people who feel lowly and oppressed. You're a man of the poor people standing against the rich. We can get behind that. That plays well in the focus groups, right? No, Jesus says, that's not what I mean at all. I don't just mean those who are materially, materially poor, though certainly they would be included. I mean the poor in spirit, Those who are not self-satisfied and proud. Those who recognize their own limitations, the limitations of their wisdom and their own power. Those who are looking for help, not from someone running for office, but from God himself. What would the consultants say to an answer like that? I imagine it would be something like this. Hmm. What do we think, everybody? Do we have any research on that? Will that play well in the focus groups? Somebody get on that. All right, Jesus, go on. What else is part of your platform? Blessed, says our Lord, are the mourners, for they shall be comforted. To which the consultants would reply, okay, that might work. Although usually usually we don't advise talking about mourning. How about anger, Jesus? A lot of people are really angry all the time. Maybe you could just shift things a little bit, say, blessed are the angry. What would Jesus say? Hopefully you can imagine the answer. No, that's not what I mean at all. I'm not really big on making people get more angry. Angry, anger is too shallow. People get angry because they don't get what they want when they want. What I'm talking about are people who are actually attuned to the deeper problems of the world, not just little annoyances, not just little inconveniences, but I mean people who see the tragedy of their condition and mourn over it, people who call out to God to come and do something about it. This isn't going well, Jesus, say the consultants. This isn't really what, you know, registers with voters. We need, we need sound bites, Jesus. We need hashtags. After all, you have to remember, people are going to just be scrolling through their phones, right? You can't ask them to think too hard. We need clips. What else do you have? Jesus would go on. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, Jesus, say the consultants, let me give you some advice here. Don't be so specific. It's good to make promises, right? It's good for everyone who's running for office to make big promises, but they need to be vague. They need to be very general. That way, if you don't deliver on it, who will know? (laughs) If you say, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, that's a little too specific, Jesus. What if you can't deliver? What if people actually think you mean it? What if they think you're telling them that you will give them 
the earth. What else do you have? Jesus would go on, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Stick with me. I know it's a long time to make believe. We're almost to the end. But I would imagine the consultant saying something like this. All right, Jesus, we like the repetition. Repetition is good. It's memorable. And that little word, blessed, that's going to register with everybody. That's a good hashtag, blessed. Everybody wants to be blessed. And we really like the second half of what you're saying. You're going to satisfy people. You're going to show them mercy. They're going to see God. They will be called sons of God. That's really good stuff. Blessed and all that future stuff, Jesus. But we're a little bit worried about what you're saying in the middle. People who hunger and thirst, it almost sounds like you're telling them that even in their poor condition, that they are blessed. You should shift it, Jesus. You should shift it just a little bit. You should make it say, the poor in spirit will become blessed. Those who are hungry and thirsty now will become blessed if they just vote for me. To which Jesus would say, you don't understand. Let me finish. I've got two more things to say. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and speak every evil thing against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in the heavens. How would you like to be Jesus' political advisor? Jesus, that ain't going to work. You're telling people that if they're with you, they're going to experience slander persecution, people speaking evil about them, people not understanding them. That's no way to win votes, Jesus. You've got to give the people something that they need, right? You've got to think like a normal person, Jesus. What's in it for them? Now, here's the good news. It's good, but it's hard. This is all (laughs) make-believe. Jesus would never run for office. He didn't come to earth to try to get you to vote for him. He didn't come to treat you like a number in a focus group, right? That's what consultants do. They kind of chop up the world into age and race and gender and socio-political sta- or socioeconomic status and education levels, and they treat you like you're a number in a big game. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus isn't interested in manipulating you with his message, in trying to get you and use you like a tool for his own gain. Jesus is simply interested in you. He is interested in saving you. He has not come to try to gain your vote or garner your vote with sweet talk and empty promises. That's the good news. But it's also hard because we kind of like being pandered to, don't we? It puts us at the center. We like when someone comes along and says, let me make a lot out of you, and then you can like me in return. It speaks to our desire to be loved, our desire to be puffed up, our own human pride. But Jesus doesn't play that game. Jesus simply speaks, and by his word, he creates trust. How is it that a message like this, how is it that a message that no political consultant would ever say, yeah, that's a winning platform, how is it that that message could gather in the full number of Israel, the 12 times 12,000? How is it that that message of Jesus could gather in a countless host, all of the saints who can't be numbered? How can this message of Jesus earn your trust? We might shift the question a little bit and ask it this way this morning. What good is it to be a saint? What do you get out of it? Is it some kind of, well, you scratch my back, I scratch yours kind of an exchange? What good is it to be a saint? There are, of course, ways that we can answer that question. The one that comes crashing through with full force this morning is that saints have hope. Saints are not normal people. You are not normal. Please understand me. You are not normal people. Some of you know that really well. But you are not normal. To be a saint 
means to be set apart. It means precisely to be not normal. You are a holy one, set apart. And as a saint, you have something far better than the normal world. You have hope. I don't just mean well wishes. I don't just mean um, optimism. You know, the glass is always half full. I mean you have actual hope. For the hope that Jesus gives, the future hope, the reward of heaven, is not some kind of pie-in-the-sky thinking. It's not some sort of utopian dream that maybe, just maybe, will work out if everything falls just right. You have the hope that is rooted and anchored in Jesus. In his life, in his death, in his resurrection and ascension, you have real and true hope. What good is it to be a saint? Well, what good is it to have hope? Hope gives you courage. Hope gives you confidence. Hope conquers the the tragedies and the problems of this world that surely we all suffer. You are people who know the end. And if you know the end, then you can endure whatever comes in the meantime. But is there anything else? What else sustains the saints? That hope, the hope of heaven, is what sustains all of the saints, both the famous ones, the Peters and the Pauls and the Marys, and also the less famous ones, the ones who you know and love, the ones who have sat in these pews with you and sung the great hymns with you, the ones who confessed their faith and their hope side by side with you in this great tribulation. What sustained those saints? Not just a future hope. Because we need more than just a future hope, don't we? I don't say that to mean like, Jesus, you've got to give us more. Jesus doesn't owe us things. He gives us things by his grace. But I speak as a human, right? We speak in this human way. We need more, right? We need more than just the future hope to sustain us. So what does Jesus give us in the present time? Let me try to make this as plain for you as possible. It might not satisfy all of your desires. It might not mean that you are too blessed to be stressed. Have you ever heard that? That was good on a coffee mug. Too blessed to be stressed. Jesus doesn't promise that kind of life. I wish we could have told Eleanor this morning, Eleanor, now that you're baptized, everything is smooth sailing. Now that you're baptized, you'll never have to worry a day in your life. But that would be a lie. That would be useless. The truth is, there will be difficulties. And you can see this more and more. This world has grown cold, hasn't it? And I think we're due for a long and hard winter. I'm not talking about the weather. We're in for a long winter before the eternal spring comes and thaws this world out. And I say that regardless of who wins the presidential race. In either case, the world has grown more and more godless. The holy things of Jesus Are they treasured by anyone anymore? The holy name of Jesus, the gift of prayer, the sacrament of his body and blood, the gathering of his people together, the saints, is it treasured by the world or is it mocked? Is it scorned? Is it ridiculed? Are you spoken highly of because you are a Christian? Oh, Christians, those are the good people in the world. Or are your opinions seen as backwards? Where did you get that idea? This is the world that we're in. And in that world, you will have difficulties. But you have the hope of heaven and you have this present reality. That Jesus sees you and says, precisely now, not just at some future date, but precisely now, you are blessed. To be called blessed by Jesus, dear friends, to be called blessed by Jesus. That's what we give Eleanor this morning. That's what we remind each and every one of you this day and every day, that you are not normal, but you have something far better. You have the blessing of Jesus resting upon you. And after all, what else matters? Do you want to have likes on Facebook? Do you want people to retweet all your... I think I'm using the words rightly. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Do you want to have the admiration of the world? Or do you want to have the blessing of Jesus? Crucified for your sins, risen for your justification, and living and ruling over all things for your good. I know what I want. I want the blessing of Jesus. Because the opinions of this world, they come and they go, and they really don't mean all that much. Every four years, there's something new. But the blessing of Jesus, that is the eternal good. 
Set your mind on this, dear friends, and let's go forward with confidence. Whatever happens on Tuesday or the rest of the week, who knows how long it's going to last, the thing that matters is having the blessing of Jesus. That is our hope. That is our love. That is our life. That is our strength. So set your heart on him. You can vote however you want, but set your heart on Jesus. Let him be your guide. Let him be your rock. Let him be your strength. And then, then you will have, maybe not an easy life, but you will have blessings, the blessing of Jesus. To him be the glory now and always. Amen.